Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction, Diane. Um, and it's great to be here with all of you today. As Diane mentioned, I've been involved in Monarch work since uh, 2015, roughly. So about the last five to six years now. Um, and that has been such a good fortune for me. It's uh, something that I've been interested in since I was very young, only five or six years old. So I pretty much landed my dream job and have had the pleasure of working to conserve monarchs all these years. Um, I always like to start with a little introduction to who we are. So, work for the US Fish and Wildlife Service and we are a federal agency as part of the Department of Interior and our mission is to work with others to conserve, protect, and enhance fish, wildlife, plants, and their habitats for the continuing benefit of the American people. Um, which means we are hoping that we are working with all of you to conserve plants and habitat for pollinator species specifically today. Um, so, just an introduction to pollinators. Uh, many of you are surely aware that our pollinator species play a crucial role in flowering plant product reproduction and in the production of many of our fruits and vegetables that we love. Um, these hardworking animals help pollinate more than 75% of the world's, pollinator, the world's flowering plants, and they also help produce about one of every three bites of food that we consume. So things like squash and apples and almonds are all produced with the help of our insect pollinators. Uh, this includes more than 180,000 species of plants and also 1,200 different crops across the globe. And in addition to helping produce our food and flowering plants, the act of pollination also provides many ecosystem services that support the health of plants, people, and the planet. And that's kind of what these white um, images are showing on this poster, which was produced by a pollinator partnership. So some of those ecosystem services is facilitating the reproduction of native and diverse plant species and that provide food and shelter for many other wildlife species as well. Um, the roots of pollinated plants bind to the soil and rock particles and this helps hold the soil together when things like flood and windstorms and landslides take over, um, thereby reducing erosion. And additionally, as the pollinated plants die and decay, this organic matter can help with nutrient cycling and improve our soil health. So those are just a few of the different benefits that pollinators help us with. And I am going to focus in on the monarch butterfly, which is just one type of pollinator um, and one that has kind of become the poster child for pollinator conservation in recent years. So the monarch, uh, monarchs go through a complete life cycle, complete metamorphosis, which includes four different life phases. Those are an egg, larva, or caterpillar stage, the chrysalis or pupa stage, and then the adult butterfly stage. So adult butterflies will find um, typically a milkweed plant to lay their egg on. The image here is a antelope horn milkweed that many of you may be familiar with throughout central Texas. This is pretty common. Um, and those eggs that are laid will hatch in about two to five days. Upon hatching, the first thing that the larva or caterpillar will do is eat that egg casing, and then it will start eating rapidly and growing rapidly as well. Um, it eats everything on that milkweed plant, the leaves, the stems, the flowers, and they actually eat and end up growing 2,000 times their original mass while they are in that larval stage for about two weeks, 9 to 18 days. Um, this is the equivalent of a human infant growing to the size of an adult elephant in a matter of two weeks. So it's really pretty impressive what they're doing there. And when they're ready, um, after they have completed this larval stage, they will actually spin what's called a spinneret, 
and attach themselves to a safe, secure spot, usually a few meters away from that milkweed plant that they've chewed up and, and eaten. Um, you might see these um, pupa or chrysalis under a windowsill, maybe underneath a bench that's in a garden, somewhere like that where they can seek shelter. And they spin the spinneret with their mandibles, which are beneath their jaw, and then they hang upside down in this J shape from their abdomen. And they'll remain like this for about 12 to 18 hours before they go through the process of shedding their skin one last time, as you see in the images here, creating this beautiful green and gold chrysalis or pupa. Um, that's their home for the next two weeks or so while they're in this life stage. Um, when they are getting ready to emerge as an adult butterfly, one of the very last things that occurs is the orange and black signature coloring of the monarch butterfly, butterfly starts to show through that pupa casing. So when you see that, you know that that butterfly is getting pretty close to emerging as an adult. Um, adult monarchs live, generally speaking, for two to five weeks during the summer months when they're breeding and reproducing. But those monarchs that fly all the way down to Mexico and live over the winter in Oyamal fir forests down in Mexico and then return to the U.S. in the spring, they actually live six to nine months. And we call those the super migration, or um, yeah, the super generation. <laughs> so um, moving along, in the United States, there's actually two migratory populations of monarch butterflies, and they're separated by the Rocky Mountains. So conveniently for us, we are in the eastern migratory population of monarchs, and our monarchs typically uh, fly down to Mexico and arrive there by mid-November, and they will stay down in Mexico in these high elevation oil fir forests until middle of March or so. Um, and as the days start to get a little bit longer in the spring and the temperatures start to rise, that seems to be the time when you start to see more monarch activity at their overwintering grounds. And then they'll head out searching for those milkweed plants upon which to lay their eggs. They arrive in central Texas, usually in late March and into April. And those monarchs that have lived through that harsh winter will lay their eggs and then die. And their eggs go through the complete metamorphosis over the course of about a month and will emerge as adult butterflies, mate and reproduce, um, flying a little bit further north in the summer months when it's really hot here. So we typically stop seeing monarchs in June um, when our temperatures are hot enough that our milkweed plants may not be doing so hot anymore, providing that host that the monarch caterpillars require. So there are four to five generations of monarchs over the course of the summer months. And on the opposite side of things, when the days start to get a little bit shorter in the fall and the temperatures start to lower, monarchs head back through central Texas, usually in August, September, October is when we get our peak, um, on their way back down to Mexico where they will spend the following winter. Um, so uh, why am I talking about monarchs right now? Well, monarchs have declined really dramatically uh, since the mid 1990s when we started taking regular counts of monarchs. And the way that we measure the monarch population is by measuring the area that they occupy in Mexico at their overwintering grounds, because that's when they're clustered together in high concentrations, all in one place. Um, typically in about 12 to 18 different stands of OML fir trees down in their overwintering grounds. So we know that in 1996 to 1997, we had this peak of monarchs where about 45 acres were occupied at their overwintering grounds. And if you fast forward to 2013 to 2014, we hit an all time low where only two thirds of a hectare 
was occupied down at their overwintering grounds or about that 1.65 acres. So very small area, very dramatic decline and it spurred much concern for what was going on and how could we help the monarch. A lot of the stressors that seem to be impacting the monarch include things like habitat loss, um, the use of genetically modified crops throughout their breeding range, there's illegal logging that occurs down in Mexico. There's also pesticides and, uh, throughout their whole habitat, insecticides, of course. Um, so a suite of different factors come into play here, but because of this decline, we have been working hard with partners to try to bring them back. And uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how that's gained international momentum as well. In recent years, we have seen a slight uptick, as you can see here, in the monarch uh, area occupied down at their overwintering grounds. And some of that has to do with our climatic conditions. You know, we've had some good wet years that are good for plants. Um, I like to think that at least in part, some of this might be the result of our work to try to create an improved habitat. But, um, you know, last year they dropped down to about two 2.8 hectares occupied. Not quite sure yet what it'll be for this winter. We should hear in the next month or so what the area occupied currently is. Um, the long-term average is about six hectares or 15 acres of habitat occupied in Mexico. So that's our goal. And that's what we would like to see consistently um, occupied there. So right after they hit that all-time low that I mentioned, the president of the United States at the time and the prime minister of Canada and the president of Mexico gathered together at the 2014 North American Leader Summit. And this event really uh, spurred a ton of conservation for monarchs and other pollinators because of all things that they could talk about, they started talking about this monarch decline and pollinators and how important they are to our economy and our food supply and this decline in all of our pollinators really was cause for concern. So shortly thereafter, um, our former president released this memo on pollinators that directed all U.S. federal agencies to work together on pollinator conservation. And about a year later, uh, that, so the presidential memo also established the Pollinator Health Task Force, and a year later they released a federal pollinator health strategy, which is this document that you see here, so that's what we call it. And that document laid out very specific goals for what we needed to get done for pollinators. And one of those goals, as you see here, was to increase the eastern population of the monarch to 225 million butterflies, occupying 15 acres at their overwintering grounds by 2020. So we were hoping to have that done by last year. Um, we have had one year where they have fallen in that range, as you saw on the graph previously, but we are working towards a 10 year average of them remaining at that stage or at that um, count. We also were directed to restore and enhance 7 million acres during that time and to reduce honeybee winter colony loss as well. Similarly, we received a petition to list the monarch butterfly as an endangered species under the Endangered Species Act in 2014, and that launched a regulatory process um, that I'm not going to spend much time talking about, but just in December of this year, of, of last year, December of 2020, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service released what's called a warranted but precluded finding about the monarch, which essentially said, we think that listing the monarch as threatened or endangered is warranted, but it's precluded by higher priority listing actions. So we have a work plan that guides what we have to do in terms of listing species. And there are 161 species that we think um, fall on our work plan as higher priority than the monarch right now. 
And part of the rationale for that is because there's so much conservation going on to benefit the monarch. So um, with that finding, we said that we would release a listing decision to propose the species as threatened or endangered if it still needs that by 2024. So that's where we're at on the regulatory side of things. Uh, but what are we doing? Uh, we are working to improve and enhance habitat, and we are working to propagate seeds, recognizing that native seed supply is something that can be a limiting factor, not just for monarchs, but for pollinators across the board. Uh, we are working on research and monitoring, and also trying to engage community groups like yours and create partnerships at the local, regional, and national scale as well. Um, just very quickly to cover this, uh, there is a what's called the Mid-America Monarch Conservation Strategy. And through that uh, partnership of state fish and wildlife agencies throughout the Midwest, which is the summer breeding grounds for the monarch, um, there is a goal to get 1.3 billion additional stems of milkweed on the ground over 20 years. Down here, we're in what's called the south core of the monarch migration route. And we know that milkweed is probably not the biggest limiting factor for the monarch in our geography. So we are focused on creating high quality habitat that includes the native milkweed species, but also our native nectar plants that are going to provide the fuel for the adult butterflies to continue their migration. So of course, how can you get involved? Well, you can create habitat, and I think Chris will be the one to focus in on that. But you can also contribute to citizen science efforts, and we hope that you do. Um, monarch butterflies are intensively monitored at every life stage. And there are programs like Monarch Watch that will provide little stickers and ask you to go out and tag monarch butterflies in the fall. Um, those stickers have a code on them. And when the monarchs reach their overwintering grounds in Mexico, folks go out and look for monarchs that have these little stickers on them. Um, and when they find them, they can enter them into a database and determine where that monarch was tagged with that sticker. So that's one way that you could contribute in the fall. Additionally, as you start seeing monarchs come through our area, we encourage you to log your sightings through Journey North, um, and they help track where the monarchs are in the course of their migration. There are numerous other ways to get engaged through citizen science, and those are just two that I would recommend for you all. Um, I would have to mention that we have worked with the Native Plant Society of Texas and the Texas Department of Transportation on the development of some safety rest area monarch way stations. Um, so in Salado and also in Hillsboro, there's these two very, or actually four, one on the north side and south side in each location, um, safety rest areas that the Native Plant Society of Texas has been gracious enough to work to restore native habitat there and incorporate signage. So you may have heard about this project in the past and Kay Jenkins has been um, such an advocate to get this work done and has created some really awesome gardens as a result. Um, that site is registered as a monarch way station, which we would encourage you to do as well if you do create habitat in your own backyard or in a community area. This is a way for us to know how many of these gardens are created across uh, the landscape and have a sense of how much habitat there is. So there is a website via Monarch Watch, uh, which is a nonprofit organization headed out of the University of Kansas. And you can certify your habitat as a Monarch Way Station and receive a pretty cool sign to put in your garden to help illustrate to others that it has a purpose um, and maybe get them to follow suit as well. I also love to recommend certifying any kind of backyard or front yard habitat as certified wildlife habitat through the National Wildlife Federation as well. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Chris here um, to give him some time to talk about 
the plant propagation and creation of habitat, but this is a list of different websites that has great resources about monarchs. I did send this to Diane, so um, you all don't feel the need to scribble this down right now, but um, I guess I will take questions probably after Chris does his segment, so I'm going to end my, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to Chris. Okay, let's see if I can get mine going. Share. And. Hello. From the beginning. There we go. Can you see? Yep, perfect. Okay, so this presentation is one of six modules that I put together on the topic of uh, native pollinator plants for, uh, or plants for pollinators. So this uh, module F is all about native plant propagation. Why would we propagate native plants? Well, uh, the benefits and purposes include wildlife habitat restoration, conservation of rare plants, uh, using plants that are adapted to our local uh, soils and climate. Uh, when we propagate native plants, we often learn a great deal about them that we wouldn't otherwise. They provide alternatives to using introduced species that may become invasive and also alternatives to that sameness of landscape plants that you can get from big box stores that, you know, they sell the same species over in the whole country. But we do have some things to be careful about. Um, first of all, you know, native plants are going to be a little more difficult to work with and there's no commercial supplies of the seeds. You're going to have to go get them yourself usually. Excessive collection of rare species can deplete local populations. And also overproduction of a small initial collection can swamp the wild gene pool, which ultimately could harm a rare species. And finally, we have to be aware that repeated cycles of propagation of a wild plant will turn it into a cultivar uh, that's dependent on human propagation. By the way, I don't know if any of you recognize that plant that I have on the right side, but I'm offering prizes for everybody who knows what that is, because it's a rare endemic of the hill country. Now, my own experience with growing native plants uh, began when I served as a Peace Corps volunteer in the agroforestry program in Guatemala. And uh, there we were reforesting land with wild native trees that we collected seeds from. One anecdote that I'll share, uh, there was a local um, uh, sort of sub shrub, like knee high plant that was very, very esteemed, highly esteemed as an edible green leaf. And it was called chipilin. It's a legume in the genus Baptisia. But uh, it was, you almost couldn't find it because people were really hungry and there were horses eating it and everything. And so I hatched this idea that we should grow it. And these people are very traditional. And they said, no, you, you don't grow chipilin, it's wild. And I said, well, I wanna buy a, you know, a kilo of chipilin. And they were like, oh no, we can't find any. And I said, well, then let's grow it. And so. The gentleman on the left side of the screen, Don Lorenzo Ramirez, was the first to um, realize, you know, this is a good idea, let's try this. And we planted cheapy lean in uh, soil conservation barriers that helped hold the soil together. And, um, and then he started selling it in the markets and people were like, oh, this is a good idea. Uh, beginning in 1990, as plant ecologist at Lower Rio Grande Valley National Wildlife Refuge down along the border, I was I directed a program where we restored native vegetation on a cropland that had been acquired for the refuge. And in this photograph, this aerial image, you see several hundred acres of land on the west side of Brownsville, right along the Rio Grande. 
that we started reforesting in the early 1990s. And by 2010, that whole area supported a diverse subtropical uh, forest. Now, focusing right on the, uh, there's my cursor, right on this field in the middle, we also use that field as a reintroduction site for an endangered plant called the tamalipan kidney petal and the rarest tree in Texas called the limoncillo. And um, you can see the, the little, uh, uh, the dots show individual plant locations that I found 10 years later in 2008. The tumulipan kidney petals on the left and uh, it had reproduced spontaneously and there were more than three times as many plants there as we planted. And you can see the uh, limoncillo on the right. Uh, since 2006, I've served as the plant, uh, state botanist here for Fish and Wildlife Service in Texas. And uh, I get to work on rare plant conservation. Continuing on the, the purposes of growing native plants, consider the plant on the left, pallid coneflower. Well, I was cutting through a vacant lot across from our office on Burnett. And here were, here were all these really interesting plants. And I identified this and I was like, Pallid coneflower has never been far, found this far south. So that represents a really unique portion of the species genetic diversity. And I collected seeds and the next year the whole place turned into a parking garage. So uh, I hope I can get those seeds to germinate. And if any of you are interested in growing it, I'll try to make those available. And on the right, you can see a project we just started um, where it's a reintroduction of Tobush fish oak cactus salvaged from one of the notorious um, pipelines that's cutting through the hill country. Um, some guidelines for seed collection of wild plants. Uh, if you're interested in this, be sure to scout the source areas frequently. And often we won't, we'll identify a plant when it's flowering but we have to come back later to collect the seeds. So use a GPS to record the, uh, the location so you can get back to them. Only collect fully mature seeds. A lot of plants simply won't germinate if the seeds are not fully mature. But that can be a problem because by that time they've blown away. So we'll talk about that. Be very conscious of rare species and not to over collect the, the seeds. Center for Plant Conservation suggests not collecting more than 10% of any population seeds in any year. Of course, in reality, we'd be lucky to collect that many, but that's their guideline. Think about conserving the genetic diversity of rare plants if you work with them. So collect fewer seeds per individual, but more individuals. And label your collection with the species location and date. Uh, we recommend that you keep source populations in the same ecological region as the area where you intend to plant them. Um, in other words, use adapted ecotypes because uh, uh, you could find perhaps uh, the same species like that pallid coneflower that I found. Uh, that ranges all the way to Canada, but if you planted Pallid coneflower from Canada and central Texas. I don't give it much chance of survival. Uh, I mentioned the seeds sometimes blow away from us and anybody who's worked with milkweeds is familiar with that. If you collect unripe milkweed seeds, they don't simply won't germinate. And the same is true of other plants like uh, wild chili peppers, um, um, grasses, for example, have to be fully so, um, but you know, uh, milkweed seeds are immature today, ripe tomorrow, and gone the next day, right? So here we used uh, uh, sheer nylon drapery material, and we wrapped it around a, an unripe capsule and wired it onto the stem. And we went back a month, and the seeds were all there. Uh, another method that we have actually used uh, 
The problem is sometimes animals are much better at collecting the seeds than we are. So here you see a scat pile of coma seeds. Coma is related to our woolly uh, bumelia here. And the animals got them first, but we just collected the scat. And um, it's very efficient. Not unpleasant, but efficient. Also, if you do collect seeds from scat, you, there are some health considerations. So wear a dust mask when you work with it. Um, and gloves, you can get some nasty parasites from animal scat. It's rare, but it can happen. Uh, one way to process those seeds would be to sandwich the scats between screens and bless them with a power hose. Uh, in any case, if you use scat collected seed, when you're all done processing, be sure to surface sterilize them with um, a Clorox solution. And we're all pretty familiar with that these days. Processing seeds, again, it all, you know, every species is different. Uh, seeds that come in dry capsules are pretty easy to, uh, it's pretty easy to separate the seeds. And you could use, um, you know, a fan to winnow the chaff away from the seed, just drop, drop the chaff and seeds from a certain height and you have a fan at the side and the seeds fall in a bucket and the chaff blows off to the side. You know, appropriate technology. <clears throat> and you can make cleaning screens out of window screen and various grades of hardware cloth and just fasten it to a two by four frame. It's always a good idea to have a number of different sizes. A lot of kitchen equipment can be really useful for seed processing. Colanders, um, you can use blenders sometimes to shatter uh, capsules. Uh, just be sure to wrap the, uh, the blades with duct tape or insert rubber tubing over them. Uh, if you have a fan that you can use and, and wire it into a rheostat so you can fine tune the speed of the fan, what you can do is set the fan down below and have a screen on top supported on you know cinder blocks or something and you adjust the speed so that the chaff just starts to blow and then you can just use like a hoe or something to rake the seeds across the screen until all the chaff is blown away. I don't know how many of you have worked with chili pekins, but you need to get the screens out of those seeds and you don't want to contact that juice at all uh, or you'll be burning for days. So I like to, uh, I let the fruits get overripe and I put them in a Ziploc bag and mash them in water. And um, then you can pour that seed and mash into a mason jar filled with water and you just let the seeds sink to the bottom and what floats is pulp and an unfilled seed. So you just carefully decant that, add some more water and if you repeat that five or ten times you'll end up with really pure seeds. One of the most common mistakes that people make in native plant propagation is not drying seeds sufficiently. Often it, they may look dry, but they still have enough moisture that if you try to store them, they'll rot. Uh, typically, moisture levels need to go to a range of 5 to 15 percent if you take the trouble to measure it. Usually, most uh, plant seeds will require at least a month of air drying before they can be stored. You almost can't overdo the drying. Uh, uh, either cloth bags or paper envelopes are often uh, uh, good for seed storage. Um, you can uh, increase the viability, the lifespan of those seeds under refrigeration, but be very careful about condensation. Uh, one problem we had is uh, people would take a Ziploc bag of dried seeds out of the refrigerator and they would withdraw the number we needed that year <clears throat> and uh, what they didn't realize is those cold seeds were condensing moisture from the air. And then you put them back in the refrigerator and the next time you use them, they're dead. So um, you have to be really careful to re-dry the seeds before that uh, container goes back inside. Now let's consider the difference between planting containerized seedlings and direct seedling. They both have their advantages and their uses. Containerized seedlings 
are best for rare species and those that have a limited seed supply. Uh, they allow us to use specialized germination methods so we get the greatest number of individuals for the amount of seeds we have. If you're collecting seeds by hand, you're probably growing them in containers. Uh, it's also the most expensive way to, per individual, but it will give us the greatest control over species composition and density per unit of area. And finally, seedlings can be grown in a container and reach a plantable size and timed for the, the beginning of the planting season. So quite often the fall is when we get a lot of rain and that's a good time to put seedlings in the ground. Now direct seeding is uh, the most economical method per individual and per unit of area uh, if seeds are available in bulk quantities. And so we're talking landscape scale restoration. Seedling rates typically range from 20 to 60 pure live seeds per square foot. That's 1.74 million seeds per acre. The seed germination is going to be dependent on environmental conditions. So site preparation and the timing of the planting are really important. And it may take several years before you really see satisfactory results. So examples of where we would use uh, seedlings include, for example, landscaping. And here you see I had this kind of wasted area at my house and I filled it full of rocks and planted all kinds of interesting native plants and they all went exactly where I wanted. And uh, it's all, almost everyone survived. And here you see another landscape we put in at Santa Ana National Wildlife Refuge. This one uh, butterfly garden had more species of butterflies than the president of the North American Butterfly Association had seen in any butterfly garden in the country. And that was when it was less than two years old. The examples of, uh, on the other end of the scale, here you see a grassland restoration on uh, former cropland in Bandera County. And you see the kind of equipment that's involved and these seeds were produced from seed farms, uh, purchased from Douglas King Seed Company. We planted 85 acres in three days. It took about five years though, before we got really satisfactory results. That one went really slow. Uh, the rainfall didn't help us. We had some very dry years there before the seeds came up. Uh, on an intermediate scale, you have smaller uh, direct seeding equipment that can be used in small areas where there's a lot of obstacles. Here, Burleson Prairie, if you've ever seen it, it's probably the first attempt to restore a diverse native prairie. It was begun in the 1970s by Bob and Mickey Burleson. They invented their own techniques and equipment. They did a beautiful job. What they did is they harvested seeds from remnant prairies and then just drove over the area, which was an old cotton field, with their pickup truck and just dumped the seeds out. And they had to do this for a number of years, but it really worked. It's a beautiful site. Germination techniques. Again, native plants can often be difficult to grow. Most natives will have some sort of dormancy mechanism to prevent the seeds from all germinating at once. Uh, plants that survive in the wild know you don't put all your eggs in one basket uh, because they might germinate under what look like good conditions that's followed by a drought and everything dies. Um, scarification, of course, involves breaking down an impermeable seed coat. On a small scale, you can use sandpaper to you know, individually knock the seed coat down one by one. For large scale restoration, we actually use concentrated sulfuric acid. Um, there are safe ways to do this that create no toxic waste. If you're interested in that, talk to me. Stratification involves <clears throat> um, exposing seeds to a specific condition for a period of time that would mimic uh, what happens in nature. Now, on the other hand, some seeds 
are recalcitrant, which means they can germinate when they're fresh, but they very quickly die. Uh, you can overcome inhibitors that cause dormancy with gibberellic acid, but another method that we used, which is very easy and inexpensive, is you use a fish tank aerator and a mason jar, put the seeds in there, and two, three times a day, screen the seeds out and change the water. And most seeds uh, require from one to as much as three days, and then they'll be ready to germinate. Many fire falling plants, which uh, a lot of our prairie species are fire followers, are stimulated either by heat or by substances produced uh, by burned vegetation. The first such substance discovered is called keratin. It was identified in 2004 and it's produced whenever cellulose is burned. If you set fire to some newspapers, you actually make keratins and they can stimulate the germination of some plant seeds at part per billion levels. You can buy keratins for several thousand dollars per gram, or you can, as I did, you can make a smoke generator. Here I used an old barbecue unit, just poured bottles of water down through the chimney, <clears throat> and I made my own smoke water. And um, this was very effective in uh, causing uh, dormant milkweed seeds to germinate. You can also use liquid smoke, by the way. Um, there's lots of different tricks to germinating different plants. Ceniso is a plant that people love to use in landscaping. It's usually grown by cuttings, which means every plant is genetically the same. This is not what we want for habitat restoration. But you can actually collect ceniso seeds. Here you see some on the left. And I'll take a Rubbermaid tub and cut some drain holes in the bottom and put about two inches of a sandy soil mix and then I just press the seeds into the surface with a jar and you just keep it moist with a mister and keep it covered and they'll germinate. And after they get, you know, a couple of inches tall, you can transplant them to a larger container. The soil medium is very important. <clears throat> uh, for some reason in North America, we always want to use these sterile potting soils that are very expensive and, and you know, commercially available. But in South Texas, I find that they really did not, plants grown in potting soil were not well adapted to the alkaline soils we were planting them to. Now, uh, we made our own soil mix out of natural unsterilized soils mixed with vermiculite, and it worked great. And part of the reason for that is that soils contain uh, beneficial fungi called mycorrhizal fungi, and here, these are actually photographs uh, that I took for my master's thesis. Uh, these are really important for getting plants to survive in the wild. And on the left, you see nodules of rhizobium bacteria uh, that also help uh, some plants uh, fix nitrogen. The type of container is really important. Down in the Rio Grande Valley, we used these plant bag containers that were air pruned. So you, if you see that, the photograph in the middle, you can see that the taproot of that seedling ends at the bottom and there's all this lateral root growth. Whereas the seedling on the right was grown in one of those round bottom containers. And typically the roots, the taproots reach the bottom of those containers and they go around and around in spirals. Plants like that, when they're put in the wild, often don't establish well, or they are maybe subject to root rot, uh, maybe five or 10 years after you plant them. On the left, you see an air pruned seedling of an anaqua tree. This was in an eight inch by one and a half inch container. And on the right, you see an anaqua that was one year after it was planted, same size. So often, the size of the container is, you know, is not that important. The, if the plant has a good root system, it will grow fast. And also, the size of the container is extremely important for costs. So 
costs are not that important if you're just landscaping your yard. But if your job is to plant a thousand acres of habitat, the costs are exponentially related to the size of the container. Here you see, um, again, I want to explain air pruning, which is where an open bottom container is suspended over hardware cloth. So when the taproot reaches the bottom, it stimulates lateral root proliferation. And that's what you want. Uh, here you see uh, a six month old guajillo seedling. It's in a one and a half inch by eight inch container. After six months, it's ready to go to the wild. And a year after you plant it, it will be taller than I am. And on the right, you see Texas ebony seedlings. Those containers are only one and a half, one and a quarter inch wide. So in one square foot of bench, you have 92 seedlings and there's no open space between them. If, a, if you are growing things in round containers, a whole lot of, you know, a lot of your water and fertilizer just is wasted. Perfect, we just hit 45 minutes. So that's what I, we were aiming for. And these are our contacts. Um, uh, Katie, uh, Dr. Rebecca Quinones and I often work together on these projects. Um, Rebecca, by, by the way, is my wife and she works for National Wildlife Federation. Um, all of these presentations under this series, uh, we can, are basically public domain. If anybody wants a copy of that, we can make these available. So now there's time for questions, so I'll stop sharing. Unless, is there anybody that would want to see any of the pictures? Why don't you go, go back to your photo of the plant you asked folks to identify? Because I did yeah. see in the chat that some, some folks put forth uh, a guess. <laughs> um, hmm. I'll just go manually. Yeah, did anybody get that? The plant on the right, can, can you all see that? I think you may have to minimize the, the people pictures. What, well, what is it? Because there's a couple, um, couple ideas in the chat. Oh, let me open the chat. <laughs> Let's see. One was plateau milk vine. Ipomoya, who said Ipomoya Lindheimeri? Betty Science. That is correct. Oh, okay. And anybody else? Uh, you saw my email. Um, so if you want the prize, the prize is as soon as I can generate seeds of that, if you want to grow it, I will give you seeds. So uh, you can, um, you can uh, email me um, interested in uh, this particular species this summer and I developed a just a, it was like a I was chasing a holy grail it was my holy grail of the summer to find this because I've never seen it if any of you know of any locations please let me know I'd, I want to expand the diversity of my collection of this species um, I think there was an answer on that that they've seen it at Wolf Creek Ranch in Burnett County Wolf Creek Ranch is that? Um, it's down by Lake Buchanan. It's a it? neighborhood. It's a gated community. Ah, neat. Let's see. I have photos and know where it is. Okay, uh, I should go up to my. There's my, my email. I just put. See it. I just put your email and mine in the chat just so that folks could hopefully see that. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Great. Let's see, what other questions do we have? Um, there was an earlier question I saw um, about concern about the loss of native grassland being converted to cropland, especially for corn or crops that are going to corn for ethanol. And the question was, do native pollinators pollinate corn crops or do native insects find the corn plants palatable to eat? So Chris, I know you have lots of experience. I'm gonna let you talk about this. Well, corn is a typical grass and it's wind pollinated. And so uh, you will see honeybees uh, foraging on pollen um, and other uh, 
uh, pollen eating species will use those, but it's not really a typical source of, of food for pollinators because it's wind pollinated. Um, do native pollinators, native plants. Yeah, well, yeah, there are insects that eat corn and then farmers spray the corn with insecticides. This is why um, there, there was a theory that when, um, when farmers in the Midwest started growing corn using genetically modified corn that was Roundup resistant, so that allowed the farmers to spray herbicides that are cheaper and therefore more often. So that wiped out the milkweeds that are in those corn fields and reduced some of the milkweeds in the Midwest. But I have a lot of doubt about that theory as an explanation for the decline of the monarch because <clears throat> if you attract monarchs into corn and soybean fields, they're going to get sprayed with insecticides. I mean, es essentially, there, there isn't a lot of organic corn and soybean production in the US. So I, anyway, that's, that's my, my opinion. What other questions do we have? Um, someone asked if you could say a little about overwintering uh, area in California. Katie, yeah. why don't you do it? You got it. Um, yeah, so I mentioned there's the two populations of monarchs in the U.S. separated by the Rocky Mountains, and we're on the eastern side. On the western side, that's the western migratory population of monarchs, and those butterflies overwinter in about 400 different sites along the California coastline and all the way down into Baja, Mexico. So um they cluster together in much smaller densities so there's very few areas where we find more than 10,000 monarchs and actually this year there's very few monarchs in general in any of those 400 sites unfortunately so similar to what's occurred in our eastern population there has been a very dramatic decline out in the west um they you know, four to five years ago had 400 to 500,000 monarchs out west. This, uh, the last, so three years ago, they dropped down to about 30,000 and remained at that level for two years. I am hearing that this winter, they're all the way down to 1,900 monarchs in the entire western population. So, this is a huge cause for concern um, to focus in on some monarch conservation activities out west, but we think that the what's called the minimum viable population is around 30,000 butterflies, so I'm not really sure um, exactly what we can do to bring them back because they've fallen so low. It's going to be a tremendous challenge. Great, thank you so much. Um, uh, Linda Onan said that there's uh, the Friends Group at the Inks Lake uh, National uh, Fisheries uh, are putting in a pollinator garden with support from Jeff Conway. Do you have educational material for outreach programs we can, so they can hope to begin again? I'm not sure what that question is. Anyway, do you have educational information for outreach programs? Absolutely. Um... We, so I can point you to a lot of different sources of outreach information, presentations and materials, uh, National Wildlife Federation, Chris mentioned Dr. Quinones, um, and she, her organization has tons of curriculum even, so I can, I can get that to you, Linda, if you uh, send me an email at the address I put in the chat earlier on. Or if you put yours in there, I can contact you as well. And you've also been invited to come by and take a look at what they've done there. <laughs> I would love to. I would absolutely love to. <laughs> okay, and in our area, what behavior is the most damaging to monarchs? Yeah, that's, um, Chris, what do, you, what do you think about that? I would say, you know, number one is habitat loss when yeah. habitats are 
uh, turned into you know development. Um, there's also a vegetation change when um, what used to be a savanna or prairie fills in with juniper trees due to uh, the la lack of wildfire and or poor grazing management or livestock management. Um, but conversely, a lot of um, well-managed rangeland in, in the Edwards Plateau can make great monarch habitat. Now areas where you have, you know, thousands of square miles of cropland um, don't have many opportunities for monarchs and worse yet, to get through those areas, they have to run the gauntlet of insecticide application, um, which is not just bad for monarchs, but other creatures that have brains uh, because the insecticides that we use um, are nerf poisons. <laughs> Interesting. Um, also, uh, although uh, the new insecticides that are used that called the neonicotinoids are actually safer for humans than the older types. Uh, they're derivatives of nicotine, interestingly enough. But uh, some of these are fairly persistent in the environment, much more so than was originally thought. And some organisms, particularly bees, honeybees, bumblebees, all kinds of bees are exceedingly susceptible to neonicotinoid insecticides. So that's a very complex um, situation where we're using insecticides that are safer for us, but a lot worse for bees. Uh, and many bee species, both honeybees and wild bees have declined. And that's a problem, especially for plants that depend on bees, right, for pollination. Um, so I think those are the major behaviors. Katie, do you want to add to that? No, I think that you hit the nail on the head. Um, yeah. Um, there was a question about the, the plant that uh, was identified that you were showing us and wanted to know what the common name was. Is it Lindheimer Morning Glory? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I got interested in it just because, you know, people like to plant Morning Glories for, you know, they're just ornamental plants. And, you know, you buy the seeds in the store and um, they're cultivars and they probably come from tropical parts of the Americas. But here we have this amazingly beautiful native species that's also, you know, it's hard to find. You know, I, I really had to look for it to find some this year. So those of you who know locations, email me. I Send me the, the locations. Okay, I think they're in the chat window. I'll save it and uh, send it to you, whatever okay. it got collected there. Um, there was another question. Um, in the Balcones Refuge, they have acres of milkweed, but they've seen very few monarchs uh, recently in the last few years. Do you know why? Um, well, I've, one thing I've noticed in my own garden, I have five species of milkweeds, and they're side by side. The really common milkweed in our area is the antelope horns. And um, the monarchs will go straight to Zizotes milkweed and uh, a rare but closely related species called emery milkweed. And they won't touch the antelope horns until they've eaten the Zizotes down to the ground. <laughs> um, so, I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but um, the monarchs do accumulate these cardinaline toxins um, that helps them survive, but the uh, milkweeds can have so much toxin that even the monarchs can't live on it. I don't know if that has anything to do with it. Um, but I think overall, I think the answer is that at the time the monarchs are migrating through one thing is they may, like this last year was kind of weird, or was it, the, you know, it was the year before this, where the monarchs came through quite early, but it was fairly cold, and the milkweeds just really hadn't developed by the time they came through. So you're not going to see many 
uh, monarch larvae at all. So timing has a lot to do with it also. Yep. I don't know if that helps. Okay, another question is what animals eat antelope porn milkweed besides monarchs? Um, thinking about a mammal, the cattle or deer? Um, because it's toxic and very bitter, uh, livestock uh, will avoid it. And so antelope horns often proliferates in grazed pastures. However, um, I've heard that uh, sheep are, just for whatever reason, they'll still go ahead and eat milkweeds. And some of the species that are very toxic, like world milkweed, um, they, sheep can be killed from eating them. So ranchers are not too happy with them. But uh, what, what really eats milkweeds are specific insects, milkweed bugs, <clears throat> of course, monarchs. And there are these introduced uh, aphids called oleander aphids, the little orange ones that will really just devastate uh, milkweeds. Um, that's, I think that's all the question which we have. Um, so I really appreciate uh, Chris and Katie um, for coming out and, well, not on Zoom and talking to us.